So hi everybody, we're getting started. It's uh, my great pleasure to be able to introduce John Lynn. No, it, it really truly is. And, and so um, I have a couple John stories, but uh, <laughs> what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? Um, no, I, I, I first began interacting with John a couple years ago on Twitter. Um, I had just begun, you know, taking very tentative steps into tweet chats and my goal in beginning to engage in social media was to learn as much as possible. So I <laughs> sought out the most influential folks that I could find in this space and I began interacting with them. And I just began, I mean, I didn't have a strategy. I just talked to people. You know, I, I, I pretended that they all wanted to talk to me back. And in some cases, yeah, in some cases that proved to be true and others I'm still waiting for that first response from a tweet. Um, but John actually, yeah, John and I began engaging with each other and one night, you know, John had a, a very flattering comment to say, um, I think I was heading out to a party, and, and I said that he made me blush, and he said, you know, picture it didn't happen, and I shot a selfie, my very first Twitter selfie, uh, and, and sent it, I was in a car on my way to a party. And, um, you know, and John and I became very, very fast friends after that. So really, I, I attribute our friendship and my continued you know, development from a social media engagement space to John Lynn. And so I'm very, very grateful. I've been here through influential networks. I've seen John grow his businesses. I've seen him mature as an individual as well as as a business person. And I'm so incredibly proud of him for pulling this together. So I just want to give him a round of applause before you can do I, I tell him all the time that I just want to be John when I grow up. And I really look forward to hearing how. Well, uh now that I'm eulogized, I can uh, <laughs> die, right? <laughs> no, that's, that's nice of her. Uh, you know, I said the power of a wink. I guess that's the power of a selfie, right? A selfie request? Uh, you, you get Mandy to come right for me. That's powerful. So when I, when I thought about putting this session together, I, I, I looked at it and I said, you know what? There were so many sessions and so many good topics and good speakers that I literally had to have two tracks. Like I thought at first I would just have one, maybe every once in a while I'd break out to two. But there was just so much good content that I was like, I have to do two tracks. And so that's why we have two tracks almost the entire conference. And then even when I was doing that, I filled it in and I was like, even though I made everyone wake up at 7 a.m. or 6 a.m. or whenever you woke up, there still wasn't room. And so <laughs> 4.30, that's 7.30 for you, you're East Coast. <laughs> it doesn't count. No. But uh, I, I was like, there's so much content that I was like, I want to do a session of potpourri. And, and I, I thought about this time, um, I took my wife to the Amalfi Coast in Italy, in this beautiful town called Positano. I don't know if you've ever been, but if you haven't been, it's heaven. You should go. And, and so we were there, and uh, they said, do you want to go have this meal? And and the foodies in the room will enjoy this. We said, sure. And so they, they picked us up and they took us. In Positano, the, the city literally builds into the mountain and they drove us up. So we're going on this, usually you ride a chicken bus because literally there's chickens on there. There's no one lives up in there. They grow these lemons this big and it's an amazing place. And they drove us up to this restaurant. So we're overlooking the Mediterranean Sea and we have this meal. <laughs> And it started off with like four appetizers with some beans and some salad and then they brought some french fries and then they brought 17 different pastas. Or I can't even remember, there's so many, all these pastas. And then they brought like seven meats to us and we're eating and we're just having a taste of all of this amazing food and, they brought, and then they brought some fruit and then dessert and you, you're getting the point, right? So that's what I hope this is today. It's an aside. <laughs> I use the Italian word, un assaggio, a, a taste of a whole bunch of things that will hopefully get you interested. And if I don't bring them up and, you know, you have another taste that you want to talk about, then raise your hand and let's do it. I think everyone here has, you know, been pretty open. And if you have a topic, you're like, you know what, you guys haven't covered this. Then let's talk about it. And maybe I'll have the answer or maybe we'll turn this mic around and maybe one of you guys will answer uh, as well. So, you know, hopefully it's collaborative, but I put a few things together that I was like, I would be sad if this conference didn't talk about them. So here's potpourri number one, the sales funnel. I'm amazed at how poorly people do with the sales funnel. And I see it every day because all these people are advertising on my site. And unfortunately, I can only do so much. I can drive as much traffic to your sales funnel as possible, but once it gets on your site, I can't make the sale for you. So 
as an advertiser, I want them to be more successful at dealing with their sales funnel. And this is a standard one that I just grabbed off of it, and the numbers may change for your market, your niche, whatever. But that's kind of how people have looked at it forever, right? Oh, you drive 3,000 visitors, then you get a call to action, which gets 600 people to respond. Then the lead interacts with the company. That's about 150 people from that actually interact, et cetera. And then you finally get 10 sales, right? That's how everyone's kind of looked at the sales funnel. And it, you know, it's a simple process. I drive traffic, I get a bunch of leads, and then I have a customer. The problem is, I've never seen it work that way. That's not the, how the sales process works. I mean, sure, every once in a while you'll have a sell like that. But I like to describe it more as a bunch of buckets, right? You have a whole bunch of buckets where you're driving traffic to it. Whether it's your social media efforts, that's one bucket of people that are interested in your product. You have paid media, earned media, you know, everything that we've talked about at this conference and we'll talk about tomorrow, all of these things drive traffic and they go into a different sales funnel and a different response. So it's not one big sales funnel and you're funneling all your traffic into it and then you're responding the same way. No, someone that follows you on social media is very different than someone who subscribes to your blog and now gets an email every time you write a blog post. Those are different people and they require a different follow-up. And the same thing goes when you talk about the leads buckets. Like what's a lead? Well, they filled out a contact form, that's a lead, right? But if they downloaded a white paper, that's a different lead. And you should follow them up very differently. It's not one big sales funnel, it's multiple sales funnels and, a bu and I like to say a bunch of buckets and you need to deal with them depending on how you got them in the first place. And even once you finally contact them, so let's say they fill out a contact form or they do a white paper download and you reach out to them and you say you know, that you, you know, you're interested in interacting with them or you want to sell or whatever your process is, you should follow up with an email, however you want to nurture it. You know, some people are ready for the RFP. They just need you to fill it out. Everyone knows how to do that, right? But what if they're just considering it? Well, now they're in a whole new bucket. They've interacted with you in one place and now they're considering it. Well, that's a new way to follow up with that person. Or maybe they're just someone in the future. Maybe two years down the road, they're gonna buy your product. So how are you gonna nurture that relationship with them forever? And in fact, that's really the goal, I think, and I think it's what many people miss, is they pump a bunch of traffic in, they take the low-hanging fruit, and they forget about all the stuff that's really valuable. Because they're like, oh, I need these sales, and that makes my boss happy because I reported that we made these sales. But what about all of that other fruit that's much higher, that's harder to get to, that's harder to sell? How are you going to nurture them, and what are your processes to do what I call moving them from bucket to bucket. We focus way too much attention on how do we drive traffic, which is important, and not all traffic is created equal. But all of you know how to do that. You know how to say, is this valuable traffic or not? You guys are good at that. But what we're not good at doing is how do I move that traffic that hits my site into a cell? How do I move them from bucket to bucket? So that maybe there are social media traffic. Now I convert them to a lead, which converts them to the salesperson, which now I understand. Do they have an RFP? Do they have it? And then follow up accordingly. So that's my first potpourri item. In fact, let me throw in one more twist. Well, it's great to move them from bucket to bucket, but it turns out sometimes the sales funnel, you can just remove it completely. If we could get rid of traffic, and just buy the leads directly, still the same process, right? But you just cut out that whole first step. And you can do that, right? In fact, you can even just get rid of the leads completely. Forget about buying traffic, forget about doing leads. You can just get customers. What do they call that? They call that affiliate sales, right? <laughs> That's what a lot of people do in a lot of industries. In healthcare IT, it's a little harder depending on what you're selling. But there, that's the potential. And so then you're saying, forget the traffic buckets, forget the lead buckets, I'm just gonna pay a commission. The question here isn't, is one better than the other? Because they all work. Every one of these, you can do the full cycle, buy some traffic, which is really cheap, right? And then drive your leads and then turn them into customers. Or you can buy the leads, which are a little more expensive than buying traffic. 
and then you convert those leads into customers. Or you can pay someone else on an affiliate commission, something even higher, <laughs> so those are the most expensive, to get customers. All of them work. The question is, what kind of company are you? Who do you want to be, and how do you want to sell? Do you want to do the full cycle? Is your company comfortable with that? Do you have the budget to be able to just go and do the affiliate program? Is that your skill? Is that who you want to be? So this is my first uh, potpourri item. Uh, like I said, if you have questions, feel free to chime in. Here's potpourri number two. And then now you're going to see why it skips around, right? It's a little taste. <laughs> this is my secrets to pitching, which I uh, kind of uh, alluded to in the last session. Uh, this is my thoughts. You can certainly take them for what they're worth. They may not apply to all journalists. If I'm a journalist or a blogger, you can decide that too. <laughs> and what's the difference? But here's just a few things that I think will work, and I think they'll work with most journalists. So these are my takes. The first is keep it short. I loved what uh, Carol was, oh, she's here. She talked about, I read the first paragraph, right? You could send 12 paragraphs, but the first paragraph will likely get read. So why even send the other 11? If I look at it and I'm in a hurry and I see 11 paragraphs, I might say, Oh, you know, I read the headline, not so interested. But if I see there's one paragraph, that might, I might just sit there and read it and understand. And say, oh, if I want more, I, can, I know I can always ask for more data, right? And related to that is links are good. In fact, that's one way to keep it short, right? You keep it short enough that it's enticing and says, oh, I, I should just read it, you know? They sent me four lines, I can read that, right? And then if I'm interested in those four lines and I have a link to read more, I'll say, okay, let me find out what they're really talking about and I can dig in more. So links are good, and there's a second side to the links that's good. One is that helps you keep it short, which I think is valuable. The second is when you have a link in there, or if you're gonna link to their company and you send me an email, and there's two, two sides of thinking to this, so let me frame it the right way. If you send me a pitch for your company, give me a link to the company website. Make it easy for me, right? <laughs> I, I'm surprised how many pitches I get. Am I talking to the one side of the room, too? How many pitches I get that, I, that don't even include a link to the company website? Every once in a while, I'm like, oh, this sounds kind of interesting. And I'm searching for a link. You know, I'm going through the email. I'm like, well, maybe they weren't that interesting, right? Because we're all busy people. So make it easy, right? Provide a link. Now the other side that someone might argue is say, well, if you put too many links, you might get hit the spam folder. But if you have a relationship with that blogger or that journalist, then you're probably already in their email list and they're probably not gonna go to their spam folder anyway. So that's the idea of links are good. The second, and I've kind of hit some of this, is make it easy. It's kind of like a river, right? What does a river do? It follows the path of least resistance. So how can you, as a PR person, as a marketing person, pitching a journalist or blogger, whoever you want to do it, make the path of least resistance easy for that blogger? Because guess what? I have to post somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 plus blog posts every week. That's just the nature of all my sites. Sometimes I do more, some, but generally that's kind of a baseline. So I need to publish that many because that's how I've built my business. The question is, what am I gonna post? If you send me a 12 paragraph thing full of jargon and I'm not sure exactly what the pitch is and I'm not sure how my readers will get value from what you pitched me, that sounds like work, right? <laughs> I might as well just write my own thing where I know that they're gonna get value and do it. But if you send something that makes it easy for me, like, wow, that is a story I hadn't heard before, or that's an angle on this subject that I hadn't really considered, then you make it easy for me. That's why guest blog posts have been so successful, right? They're pretty easy to do, as long as they're good quality. But don't underestimate that it, it isn't as easy as you would think. <laughs> I mean, because if you don't format it the right way, and then I want to get a picture so it looks good, and I mean, there, there is some work even in a guest blog post that I could almost 
type that number of words with my own ideas and my own thinking as fast. So you need the guest blog post to be valuable enough, but also, so, so you need to make sure it provides value enough so that then you use the guest blog post rather than whatever other content. But the reality is journalists need to write. We need interesting stories. We need valuable stories. So if you have something that's really valuable, we all want it. Just make it easy for us to be able to do it. And related to this is be interesting, right? I, I, it's, a, it's key to any, any journalism. I, I, I have a blogging philosophy. There's three points to it. The first, the first point uh, that I think is most important is that anything that I post needs to be interesting, needs to be valuable, needs to be funny. And if it meets those, then I'm happy to publish it, right? So it needs to hit that core goal of my reader should walk away from it and say, I got value. And if they do, I feel good about that blog post. Now, I'll admit, sometimes I don't reach that. But that's the goal of everything I do. And anyone that's pitching me needs to consider how am I providing value to that reader? And then it will be more successful. Be personal. I, I think uh, we talked a little bit about this in the last session, too. You know, know the person that you're sending it to. Uh, if you're sending high-tech answers, you know that they want to do healthcare and IT, nothing else. And you know they pitch that. And if it's a meaningful use angle and it makes sense, you know they're going to write about it if it's interesting and valuable. But know them and be personal, because when you're personal, it changes the response you get, at least for me. When I respond to someone, if they send me a pitch and it feels like you just BCC to 40 people, right? I'm going to say, well, those other 39 covered it, right? Or they could, so who cares? But if you say, John, I saw your article about HIPAA Omnibus and how that, you know, XP is expiring tomorrow. And guess what? We have a story that we have 12 hospitals and they all don't. <laughs> you get the idea, right? You're leveraging the article. You're a person like, wait. And I think, oh, you read my stuff? Which ego plays into it as well, right? <laughs> That's good. And then you just tied it in. So now I have a follow-up story to something that I obviously thought was interesting because I wouldn't have posted it otherwise. So be personal and you'll get a very different response. Even if I don't accept the story from someone, if they've written a personal request for me to write a story, I give them a personal response because I think that's the gentlemanly thing to do. That's the way I'd want to be treated. And know their quirks, right? Know what's interesting to them know what they like, do they do like guest posts, can they do something that's humorous, or do they really need some straight lace stuff, do they need some more technical stuff, or can they do more high level strategic thinking, know what their quirks are, and what they like and don't like, do they like to be pitched on Twitter, do they want to be emailed, do you want a phone call, the answer to that is no, no one wants a phone call, <laughs> but, uh, and that's not just me I think, <laughs> and then the other one is, uh, be time zone friendly. And maybe I say that as a biased West Coaster. And usually I can tell you 90, uh, no, actually 100% of the uh, t time zone unfriendly people are from the East Coast. <laughs> but uh, so. I don't believe there's anybody that lives anywhere past the Mason distance line. That's exactly why. You said it, not I. <laughs> but be time zone friendly, right? I mean, if it, I had a pitch come to me, and it was a pitch to meet at Hymns in Orlando which is Eastern time, I'm in Pacific time, and they sent me the time frames in Central time. I mean, I like math and I like complicated problems, but it was driving me nuts. <laughs> Just trying to figure out, what, and then I had to look at my schedule that was in some other time. It didn't make sense. So be time zone friendly, and the same goes for pitching, right? I mean, if you called me at, 4 a, at 7 a.m. in the East Coast, that's 4 a.m. for me which I might have just gone to bed, but otherwise, <laughs> you didn't catch me. So be time zone friendly. This one's another one of my favorites, is uh, live up to whatever adjectives you use. Because you will ruin your relationship with whoever you're pitching if you use an adjective and they know you're wrong. And I don't know about most journalists, but the way I approach it is I want to be a thought leader and I want to know this industry. And if you pitch me something, 
with an adjective that says, I'm the best or I'm the only, my favorite's the only one. And I know that there's three others that have pitched me before or that I've written about before or that I know are better. <laughs> like that is the easiest way to ruin the relationship. Because I see that pitch and actually I get, it's actually pretty fun, I get a little humor out of it. Like, really, did they write this? Like who reviewed this? Maybe that's why you need an agency to review it and make sure. <laughs> but yeah, live up to those adjectives because they're going to hold you accountable whether they tell you about it or not. They're going to read it and say, you're the best. Well, I don't agree, and they're going to move on. The second is, uh, and this is particularly uh, advice for larger companies. Uh, you know, you know the, the large companies I'm talking about. <laughs> I won't mention any names. But the key is make them feel like a star. Make them feel like they matter. Don't offer them the low-level product manager that probably doesn't even know anything about your blog and doesn't know what you're writing about and, and this is especially true for uh, trade shows where you might actually go and meet with them and meet with them if you offer that low level of person when you know that oh that CEO is the guy that's interesting and that's the one I want to talk to then you're gonna ruin the relationship as well you, they may even take it and sometimes I take a you know a different one if I think it's interesting or whatnot but make them feel like they matter when you offer them someone at a company because if you offer them the low-level person, then they'll give you low-level treatment, right? But if you offer them someone of real value that they know is going to be interesting, then it builds the relationship and you'll get a better article. Of course, you can also make the case that in some cases, they're, especially when they're really large, that they don't want the top person because that's not who they cover. But give them the top, the highest person that you can get them that makes sense for their niche. It goes back to ego too, right? The next is uh, Be Right, and this is actually the second part of my blogging philosophy. Interesting how PR and blogging are very similar, right? Be Right, it solves a lot of issues. goes back to the adjectives as well. Get the name right. My name's John, not Lynn, in case you're wondering. I know Lynn is sometimes a man's name, right? But that's, that's the first turn off, I think, for most journalists. When you say, hi, Lynn, uh, it doesn't work so good or John without an H, or whatever you, variation you want. Uh, we know these ones, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, HIPAA. For those not familiar, it's two A's, one P, right? One M, two S's. So, you know, when we see that, we say, wait a minute, who wrote this? And it's not that we're, you know, I certainly make plenty of mistakes. You could go to my blog and probably find a lot of errors. And that's fine, I, I think, you know, I, I don't think it, I think some people take it too far. I don't necessarily, but you know, be aware of it, otherwise it loses some credibility. And this is my favorite Freudian ones. These were from hymns. I pulled them out because I knew I, I, I thought it would be make a good blog post and that it, it works good for a presentation. So here's a good one that we got. The trial of paperwork. <laughs> they are checking the trial of paperwork, which paperwork is a trial, I guess, but they really meant trail, which is a little mistake. Those indicted below, <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I don't know if they, what they were indicted for, but if they were, I would write that story. I'm just pretty sure you're not reaching out to me to tell that story. <laughs> but if they were, maybe I should have written the indicted story. <laughs> I'm not sure they're present. <laughs> maybe. I wanted to know about their <laughs> and you see why you need to hang out with him at the party. <laughs> exactly. It's true. The autocorrect doesn't always work, right? We invite embers of the media. I guess that's the remnant after we get burned. <laughs> but uh, that's the thing. I mean, we all understand we're human. And I think, you know, as people, we're very forgiving. And that's fine. I often laugh it off. But, you know, you do lose some credibility if you're not careful. Especially if you do it over and over. All right. Popery number three. Are there any questions? How are we doing on time? <laughs> Video marketing. 
I really wanted to do another video marketing session. We're going to kind of do a little bit of it tomorrow morning. But I think there's a lot of potential for video. And I don't think we've tapped that in healthcare IT. I don't think we've done enough. And I, so, I believe in this so much that I, I launched ehrvideos.com to do videos. And, uh, you know, it's an evolution for me. I'm sure I'll continue to evolve it and learn how to do it. And the reason I never did it before was that the cost was so high to do good video. But the amazing thing I've found is that with tools like Google Plus Hangouts, it's free to do really great content. Now, that means you have to have great people that say interesting things, but I hope you have those, right? If you don't, you might want a different company, right? <laughs> but if you have great people, which I'm sure everyone here is saying, yeah, our people are great. Maybe a few that are saying, yeah, the great people are, but they won't go on video, which is a different challenge. But video is really going to be an amazing opportunity. And let me tell you why and how. First is the why. I think this is the next level of SEO. There's a reason Google bought YouTube. Because what is YouTube? A really big search engine. Right? But just for videos. You search for videos. And then they're also integrating those videos and those video results into the search results. So if you do a search for something, Google takes up a whole search result with five to ten videos, sometimes three. It depends on how many there are for whatever you're searching for. And that's a tremendous opportunity for you to use Google's bias towards wanting to promote YouTube to get to the top of the search results. Because guess what? In healthcare IT, there's not that many people making great videos. And if you create great videos that get a bunch of views, and you're on those search terms using good tags and good titles, just like you would a blog post or just like you would anything else that you're applying SEO, which is an SEO session tomorrow, you're going to be listed and your videos are. And so I think there's a tremendous opportunity to leverage that and a way to insert yourself in SEO that you maybe wouldn't have been able to compete with otherwise you didn't have the budget for a woman. How easy is it to grab an embed video from YouTube and put it up? You're like, geez, I just created a whole bunch of content and I publish it. If it's good, right? the human connection that we talked about too, right? The human to human connection. There's something when you look in someone's eyes and you make a different connection, right? The second is uh, there's more tools for watching videos. I mean, how many of us have tablets that you just can watch it easy, right? It's so easy to access the videos on our cell phone. The key though is make them memorable, right? In fact, a great video is super memorable. If you've seen one, and you, you, you get the whole experience of seeing, hearing, and feeling an emotion when you watch a video. I mean, if you commit three minutes of your time to watch a video, you're going to have an emotion. Of course, the word of caution is the emotion could be these people are a bunch of jokesters, or <laughs> these people aren't professional, or they don't know what they're talking about, right? There is that risk. But if you do, right, there's also the opposite. These people are geniuses. They're solving a real problem that I need to solve myself. And so there's a real opportunity, and they'll remember that, committing that much time to actually seeing it. So how do you do it? This isn't the how of how do you produce video. Uh, talk to Subin if you want to do that. <laughs> he is the genius that created all the new MD and the videos for this conference. Um, but be creative. And I would say creative, not in the sense that you have to be funny or witty or anything like that, but be creative in how you leverage your limited resources. Because we all have limited resources, limited video editing skills, limited budget, limited time. 
And so think, how can I be creative? The most creative video I ever saw was a slideshow of about 50 or 60 images that, with the guy saying, you guys have this, paper charts. You need to get rid of this. <laughs> we do this. This is your pain. You want to solve this money. <laughs> he went through this and told this whole story about how his for lack of a better term, stupid scanning solution <laughs> that probably would have been super boring watching any other way said, you know what, I do have that pile of paper charts and I do need to solve that problem and I just spent a minute and a half doing it. Did he have any video production skill? No. I've taught, I was Scoutmaster and I taught 12 year old boys how to make videos just the same way with free software on your computer. So it's not hard. The key is how are you going to be creative with your limited resources? There isn't, unfortunately, but luckily they were all already past it, so all they all they needed was to have fun, so that's what we did. <laughs> and they've all become Eagle Scouts, actually, but anyway. <laughs> so uh, the next one is be interesting. We talked about this, right? No one's going to watch it if it's not interesting. You know, I, I talk about my video. I said no one watches it for, for production value, but if the content's good, you build that relationship and they understand that. And then people share it if it's good. And then be useful. Same thing we were talking about with press releases, same thing we are talking about with other content. And then the key question is, how are you going to distribute it, right? Same goes with the blog post. You can write it on your corporate blog, but who's going to read it? You can create your video and put it on your YouTube channel, but who's going to read it? So have a strategy for, once I create this video, what are the techniques I'm going to use to get people to watch it? Are you going to email your own personal list, your client list? That's a great way. It costs nothing, right? We created a great video. We thought it would help you. Now you just increase the views and could help you in the search engine, all of those things as well. So have a strategy or find a platform that will let you distribute it and drive those views as well and get exposure for it. Number four. Are there any other topics? Do you guys like this? <laughs> Hopefully. How much time do we have? What are we I don't know what the number four is, but the only other topic I was thinking about that I didn't get to online and I think would be a really good one to talk about would be uh, measurement. Measurement. That's good. A load could be like a whole day. That's a good question. I think, you're, are you talking a little measurement, Thomas? We have a little one uh, later. Uh, yeah. CR measurement is always the winning topic. <laughs> That's his entire business right there. Thomas <laughs> Knoll. <laughs> let's, let's have a, Thomas uh, is here. He's a, he's a local Las Vegas guy. He doesn't do healthcare IT, but he's built a whole business around how do you measure PR, safe to say, right? Called Prime Loop. Well, this is a safe <laughs> So uh, I'd love to hear, uh, I mean, I'd, will it ruin your presentation? Go to it, or, or uh, do you have a few thoughts? On the other end of it is we actually have the ability technically now to watch the engagement and interactions over time. Um, and for whatever reason, people would rather show charts and graphs than to show relationships with people. Um, and so I think it's much more interesting to think about it from the perspective of what's the quality of relationship that we have with our customers and potential customers. Um, rather than 
So I had, I had a couple of things. Uh, th thanks, Thomas, for uh, <laughs> stepping in. Um, I, I, you know, I heard a, a, a vendor came and told me a, about their PR company. I won't look up for. Uh, <laughs> but uh, they, they told me they said, yeah, they said the reason we should work with them is because they'll help us not say something stupid. Or, and this is paraphrasing, <laughs> right? They'll, they'll make sure we say it the right way and phrase it the right way. And I wondered. It, it, I mean, that, I think that's valuable, right? I think there's value there. But is that a cop-out to numbers and, and to, uh, to, to the other side of things, right, that, that says we're actually having impact, or, you know, beyond just, you know, preventing you from doing something, you know, a mistake. So, uh, so I, th I thought that was an interesting insight when I heard it. I was like, really, that's their pitch to you? It's like, maybe I need to be in that business. But, <laughs> you know, I was like, that, that, that's, that's hopefully there, there's more. The other one that I think is interesting is, I did an engagement with a, a, it was actually a PR company and a, uh, and with, with their client and they had me do some sponsored content and we did some sponsored content together and then afterwards they asked me for, uh, for the data, which I think if someone, if a regular PR person said, would you write a story and then say, oh, what was the data on the story that you did? I probably would have been like, I'm busy or, you know, like I probably, but since they did sponsored content and paid for it, I was happy to go in and provide that data. So, I mean, it, certainly that was another session as well, you know, between earned and paid media, but I think there's something to say about that, right? That you can get at some of that internal data that you might not have gotten otherwise that helps you understand that reach. I thought, yeah. Go ahead. No. Last time? Yeah. Oh, okay. I guess you're not going to see four. Oh, you're not going to see four? No, 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 you can see four, but you just have to make sure you leave time for people to ask you more questions. All right. <laughs> so, is the project manager? <laughs> this one's a short one. I think the rest are pretty short. White papers. The, the problem is, so many of them are boring. <laughs> I mean, for the love, really. I mean, it's just they're terrible. If you can write an interesting white paper, you can do really well. Don't be boring. <laughs> Hang out with him. Not with him. <laughs> Here's five. Don't us or underestimate email. I think we talk, look at social media. Email was the original social media, right? It's the original way we interacted. And it's still incredibly powerful. It has its weaknesses. It has its flaws, but everyone does. Don't underestimate email. People still read it. There's different types of email lists. We won't have time to go through. But here's a little view at different ways. You can create your own list. And sec, you know, one key I wanted to share is segment it. Don't kill it. Segment it and provide them value, same as we've talked about. That's the theme of this presentation. You can borrow someone's list, pay to send it out, or you can just purchase it. There's lots of options. Here's some missed opportunities maybe you think about, because I don't think we do this in healthcare IT. And I ask the question, why don't we do them more? Because the rest of the world is. Are we doing mobile marketing? Think about that. Do you have a mobile op uh, mobile advertising plan? Has anyone done a mobile campaign in healthcare IT? Because I'll tell you, the rest of the world is, right? Image marketing, Pinterest, Instagram, they're huge. But what do we do in healthcare IT? I could do a whole session on landing pages. I wish we did, but there was no time. <laughs> but why don't we do these more? Why don't we do better testing of our landing pages? Opportunity is missed by most people because it is dressed in overalls and looks like work. And I think that's why we don't, right? A lot of it's work. That landing page stuff is work and doing it well. Here's the future of marketing, which we'll end with. You can ask questions. This is my view of where we're headed. I think that content marketing, which you know, everyone loves that buzzword, right? But everything's content. That's so you're going to use content. 
You have to do great content. You have to get distribution. And you need as many influencers to hop on that as well and spread that content. And I think that you know, every person that I talk to, I tell them about display advertising and they say, mm, you know, yeah, uh -huh. and I tell them about content marketing. Yeah, we want to be there, right? It's like almost this visceral, like, that's where our company needs to be. And I think that's where it's headed. It's, it's a hard sell cycle for many of these people to sell content to it. And, but I also don't think that display advertising is dead. I think there's still value in it. But the display advertising is going to take two forms. It's going to remind people of the content that they read. However you got that content, whether it was earned, whether it was paid, the display advertising is going to reinforce that, hey, I've read 10 articles about HIPAA and you know, HIPAA privacy, and now I need a solution. I'm going to see the display. Oh, yeah, they know what they were talking about. I'm going to buy. And the display is going to reinforce the content. And then second, it's going to feel like content itself. I love the idea, and there's a reason there's a, a BMW on here. If you love cars, and you go to a car site and add for a BMW the latest, and this is a feature car or whatever, it's not advertising. It's content, even if they paid for it, because it's so good. And I think this is where it's headed, this mix of content and display advertising that's as good as content and reinforces what you're doing with blog posts, with video, with all the other content. Every company is a media company. And one last thought, I forgot I had this, this is worthwhile. We're in time, right? Good. <laughs> if I go over, I'll talk to the organizer. I think he'll be okay. <laughs> save that for home. <laughs> so I love this idea of the tortoise and the hare, right? Are you a tortoise marketing company or are you a hare marketing company? Do you like to go for the fire hose marketing campaigns? Oh no, it's two weeks before hymns. I need to blow a whole slew of money because guess what? I need to run to the end, right? Or are you a tortoise one that builds it slow and steady? And I would suggest that neither is right. The right way is to find your own pace that's faster than the tortoise and then do it consistently. Consistency at a pace that makes sense to you is going to be more valuable than any sort of fire hose approach where you try to run too fast. Because inevitably, you'll lose your budget. You'll inevitably, you won't see the results that you want. But if you find a pace that feels right to you, and then you sell your organization on that, then you'll see the value. And it won't be the hair type thing. You're gonna have to sell it and help them understand the longer term vision, but still doing it at a faster pace than the, hair, than the tortoise might have done. So, any other questions? Well, can you go to the mic for people who are following the live stream? Oh, nice. Like to get the we got the mic. Yeah. We want Carol and Mike for sure. Ryan Lucas know that we did do that. So Ryan, <laughs> Ryan is happy. Nice. Ryan's watching back home. <laughs> now you just discouraged all the questions. Though, I think. <laughs> can you hear me now? <laughs> I can online. Can you? Yeah. It's not really a question, but really a, a comment, the tortoise and the hare. I, I think also uh, smart marketers, you, you have to be really nimble. Things happen. ICD-10 gets delayed in a nanosecond, you know, and all this money's been spent. Each of our vendors promoting the fact they've got ICD-10 covered in their in their product and what, you know, just a small example. And so, my favorite is the ICD-10 white papers that now are really not interesting. Not, they're not, they're not, at least for six more months. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I know. I, I yeah, <laughs> stage two gets extended. Sta you know, stage three gets delayed. You know, we're in a very volatile marketplace, and so. You know, everybody understands that there are budgets and there are quarters and there are annual budgets, but you have to really be nimble, especially if, you, if you're contributing content to sites like ours and yours, or you're doing any kind of you know banner advertising or white papers. It can't be like, okay, I'll redo that in three months. You have to, you have to do it now because you've now, you're no longer a thought leader, and you know now you're dealing with obsolescence. So you have to really be nimble in all of this because of just what, what's going on in the health IT industry. 
You mean you don't publish one? What's the difference between EMR and EHR? I love those pitches. You know, Robert, <laughs> you know Robert is listening to you right now. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I forgot you. <laughs> So for the viewing audience at home, uh, you can't predict what's going to happen in the future, so you have to be ready. Any other questions? Comments? Complaints about the conference? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your PR company? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? I think that whole evolution, right, of journalist, blogger, influencer, thought leader, you know, especially in niches like healthcare IT. I, mean, I don't even know how journalists write some of this stuff when they have no clue. Actually, I do know how. Someone, one of the companies told me, they said, yeah, a journalist comes up to us and they're like, uh, so I've never written about healthcare IT. They don't quite come out like this, but they, you know, they, they get the idea, oh, this guy doesn't know anything. Like, as they said, what's HIPAA or something like that, right? You find out the clue. They don't know what they're talking about. And so then you start talking to him. He said, and so then I tell them the story that they should write, <laughs> which might be a good strategy, right? Depending on the person. But there is that shift, right? Where, and I think, you know, all the PR people that have had a meeting with me can attest that an experience with me is we're having a discussion. I'm including my thoughts. I'm, you know, I'm digging in. And if you get too generic and tell me what HIPAA is, then I'm going to change the subject. You know, I'm going to move it on, right? Um, so I think it is a very different experience. So I appreciate that. Thank you. That's all. So what previous experience oh, do you question. have that makes you an, an expert in healthcare IT? Other than, you know, you, you, know, you own all of these things, and now you're an influencer, but how did you make it? Well, that's a good question. What makes anyone an influencer, right? So here's the interesting thing. I would never say I'm an expert, because I never feel comfortable <laughs> saying I'm an expert. You know, but uh, I don't know if I should tell this story on camera, but oh well. <laughs> Might as well. <laughs> it's fun. <laughs> so I got an email one day uh, from a company uh, I can't remember, I think it was an EHR company. And they replied to my email, because uh, they subscribed to my email list, right? And they replied to their email, but they thought they actually had forwarded it to all their staff. But they sent it to me. A few of you have heard the story. They sent it to me, and this is what it said. I don't think he's very smart, but he has influence. So we should read what he has to say. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was interesting. I, I thought, should I respond or not? You know, what's the right way to approach it? I sat on it for a little while. And, I, you know, I'm probably a little too arrogant, so I, I knew I had to respond, right? I couldn't leave it without him knowing that he'd done this, right? And so I, I replied and I said, uh, speaking of smart, you should consider who you're replying to when you, when you do. <laughs> and, and, and he wrote back and said, uh, you know, speaking of smart, I am not. Uh, and I thought about it, though. I was like, okay, well, you know, am I an expert? Am I smart? And interestingly, uh, he'd pitched me his idea, and I didn't just embrace it with full arms. And so I understand why he doesn't think I'm smart. I didn't, I didn't just embrace it and write some glowing article, right? Uh, so that was okay. And I was like, but he thinks I have influence. And so I'll take that. Now, interestingly enough, five days later or something like that, the next week, I get an email from this guy in reply to one of my blog posts, and he says, well, you probably think I'm a jerk, but this is what we're doing, which was what I'd written in the blog post. And I thought about it, and I said, no, I know you're a jerk, and delete, you know, <laughs> I don't need to engage, but yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, what makes anyone an expert, right? At the end of the day, the readers will decide if it's valuable or not, right? And so if you, provide, if you keep providing value to people, then you know, you, you'll gain experience and understanding. I look at some of my first blog posts, I had no clue what I was doing. I'm embarrassed by them now, but that's part of the growth too, right? And so, I mean, to me, that's part of it too, is it's a learning experience, it's collaborative. It was part of my learning. I wrote to learn as well as influence. So, there you go. Is that helpful? Yeah.
How much feedback do I give people, or? Right. I mean, I, I think my my comment was more my own feel, um, at least especially with ICD-10. I felt like I'd written, uh, you know, and I had written at least half a dozen pieces, right? But it was across, you know, four sites, and you know, so the, you know, like I'm, uh, it's always a balance, right? And then I have readers that only read one site or readers that read more than one, so, so it's hard. But I'm super engaged with my readers. I mean, I reply to every comment pretty much, you know, to something. That I, you know, if someone tweets me and says something interesting, I'm going to reply back. So, you know, I'm really engaged in that. If I post it to LinkedIn and they start commenting, I comment as well, which uh, I'm sure uh, Carrie can attest on the HIMSS site, <laughs> HIMSS group, right? So I'm, I'm really engaged with them. I want to hear what they say, uh, you know. Uh, you know, so it's a balance, but. Yeah. Sure, uh, and, and often, I, you know, they'll, they'll email me and I'll say, why don't you put that on there? That should be part of a broader discussion, right? Because I want them to have it, unless they did something real personal information of some sort, you know. Uh, but I have some, you know, <laughs> there's, a, there's a model that happens across all of engagement. And it happens on websites, it happens in comments, it happens on email, subscriber lists. There's a, you know, the 95% who just lurk, right? Just consume the content. There's the 3%, or whatever the percentages are, that engage every once in a while as they see fit. And then there's that 1% or you know, whatever small percentage it is that every post you do, they're sending you something saying their thoughts or they're leaving a comment or whatever. And that usually ebbs and flows, especially in healthcare IT. But I think that, you know, that's just universal. You can't buck that trend, I don't think. <laughs> so, any other questions? I think we're out of time. Thank you.